Hello, I'm Dr. Alan Burton, a professor at the University of Michigan School of Environment and Sustainability. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here today, and I'm, well, actually, I wish I was there, but it's my pleasure to make a presentation to you today, and I thank the uh, organizers for inviting me. But I messed up. I really should be there with you. Even though I've been to Brazil several times, somehow I forgot to get my visa. I guess I'm just too busy. But anyway, we'll have uh, this talk for about an hour, and then we'll save some time uh, at the end for questions. At that point, we will switch over to Skype, and hopefully uh, we'll able, be able to have a discussion at that point. You know, Brazil and the, and the United States are alike in many ways. Um, your country uh, dominates the Southern Hemisphere. We dominate the Northern Hemisphere. We both got fabulous natural resources and diversity. Uh, we both have very vibrant uh, scientific communities, but we both got economic and environmental challenges. But maybe worst of all, we both share dysfunctional political leaders um, I think ours is more dysfunctional than yours, and I hope, uh, well, actually, I apologize for the behavior of our president. But let's get into the science. So the history of water quality criteria. I think it goes way back to Paracelsus uh, over 500 years ago when he basically said the dose makes the poison. Um, and then perhaps some government regulators read that and said, well, we need chemical specific criteria that designate the safe dose. So we've got chemical specific criteria, but before those we had narrative criteria, which were much more general and actually allowed for mixtures. Basically it said the water will be free from substances in concentrations that are going to adversely affect that ecosystem. Perhaps that's a better way to go, so we'll come back to that at the end of the talk. What I'd like to, uh, here to remind you of uh, and remind us of, uh, all of my colleagues here, um, who get preoccupied with chemicals is that the foundation blocks for sustainable aquatic ecosystems are really much more basic than chemicals. There are habitat, uh, an adequate flow regime, or adequate water levels in the water body. We have to have the optimal temperatures occurring for that ecosystem to be healthy, and the associated dissolved oxygen. We've got to have the appropriate major ions that are there, um, an oligotrophic versus a eutrophic versus a, a brackish a saline water. Uh, those have to be right for the particular ecosystem. And finally, we have to have food, food that's adequate for the organisms that live there. So let me just quickly run through uh, some assessment limitations that, that we deal with now all the time. Uh, it's very popular here uh, in the states to use tissue concentrations to designate whether fish are safe to eat, which makes sense. But the problem is, when we're looking at trying to connect those fish tissue concentrations to contamination at a site, we tend to forget that fish move. And fish generally move a lot. So they're moving in and out of these areas of contamination. Passive sampling devices have become very popular. The SPMEs, the DGTs for metals, which are very good at integrating exposures over time. But again, these are at one point in space and they do not reflect the organism's movement in and out of different concentrations. We like to sample at low flow, partly because it's easy, it's safe, and we don't tend to sample uh, streams and rivers at high flow when it can be more dangerous, but that is when the major loading of nutrients, solids, and chemicals occur. So we're ignoring that whole exposure period. We collect samples of sediment, uh, of water, and of fish or benthic invertebrates at a site, but not always at the same point in time, not always at exactly the same place. So we're drawing correlations between these three lines of evidence when really there's already a lot of uncertainty about the relationship of those three assessment points. 
Sometimes uh, we set criteria by spiking chemicals into water or into sediments and seeing what dose is safe. While that may be fine for some laboratory efforts, uh, the, the chemicals that we spike tend to be more bioavailable. And we'll, I'll show you some research later on to show how dramatically bioavailability will change through time. Many chemicals are more toxic at higher uh, temperatures or at lower temperatures. And to make it more complicated, it's concentration dependent and chemical dependent. And our criteria that we've set up uh, in most of the developed countries are really based at one temperature. Exposures often at 20 to 23 degrees Celsius. So this is very misleading when it comes to natural exposures and toxicity. So finally, we, we need to, to, to get it right. And that's what I'll be talking about in the talk today, is how do we use a weight of evidence approach uh, that captures all of these elements, the, the changes through space and time of exposures, um, getting it right with young and old organisms, and so on and so on. There's, uh, the, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency summarizes all the data, water quality data, from the states, the 50 states, every two years. The latest uh, summary of all of the waters in the United States for streams and rivers shows that this is the ranking that the EPA says are the major causes of impairment. And it's kind of interesting, the first one is pathogens. I, I normally wouldn't think of pathogens impairing um, environmental waters, but this becomes number one because of wastewater treatment plants and the permitting and the, the monitoring that goes on at these plants. So there's a lot of data that shows pathogen violations at these treatment plants. But next we have metals. Metals are everywhere. Um, are they, these are total metals, these are not bioavailable metals. And then we have nutrients, uh, organic enrichment, sediment. These are all more natural things that we don't have specific criteria for or that we tend to focus on, followed by PCBs, mercury, and, and many, many others. If you look at this nice database that came out of the state of Ohio that goes back 30 years uh, of co-located data of habitat, chemistry, and biology. And all of that data was taken and correlated and they came up with this uh, identification of what the major stressors were. And you see by, and by far that urban runoff is the number one stressor in this state that is pretty human dominated. It's primarily agriculture and municipal, uh, urban municipal areas and uh, less uh, forest. So um, a lot of things, of course, associated with urban runoff, but you see it's not coming across as, as one specific chemical that's causing the problem. There's been a lot in the news over the last few years about uh, harmful algal blooms and anoxic conditions that are occurring due to excess nutrient loadings that are going into our waters from our, again, our human dominated waterways. Here on the, on the left side of the screen, you see uh, the, um, where I'm pointing out here, the red area is our levels of phosphorus that are pouring into the, the western basin of Lake Erie. These in turn, um, during the summer, end up causing the bottom of Lake Erie to go anoxic and, and lose the oxygen. Here uh, is a bloom of two different kinds of harmful algal, algae uh, that occurred back in 2011, but right now, at this point in time, we have the same thing happening in Lake Erie again. And it's because of the spring rains. The spring rains were heavy and they moved a lot of nutrients uh, into the lake. We've also got some, some good climate models uh, and, and combinations of climate models that come together. So here you see uh, some data. The top graph is showing uh, precipitation intensity, not quantity, but intensity. So really extreme precipitation events. Uh, and the bottom uh, figure is drought, dry days. 
And you see that here uh, in the upper part of the U.S. where I live, that we have extreme events increasing and a lot more water at the same time in the southern part of the U.S. and the western part of the U.S. Uh, we have increasing drought occurring. Uh, and as you know, there's, there's drought occurring in, in Brazil. So these conditions are going to continue and they are going to dramatically affect uh, contaminants um, as I'll talk about a little later. So here uh, is some data, and if you will, this is for our area that we live in here in the Great Lakes, and the size of these black uh, dots uh, tells you the frequency of increased extreme events. So 100% increase uh, in extreme events in the state of Michigan where I live, and it really started in the 40s, uh, and you see this really nice correlation going up uh, for 24-hour events and seven-day events, uh, at the same time our flows and our rivers are increasing. So this is having a dramatic impact on our ecosystems. This climate change is also causing drought. So we have a picture from Yellowstone National Park of, ex of uh, intense forest fires. Uh, as you know, these have been spreading uh, dramatically in the U.S. In, in recent years, and they're occurring in areas that they've never occurred before. And this ends up causing an, an increase in runoff uh, from these uh, landscapes that are burned where we have elevated solids, total dissolved solids, and nutrients. Uh, the flows in these areas become flashy, uh, more altered as they do in urban environments. Turbidity and siltation increase, temperature and UV light is increasing, and the increased runoff is bringing in more metals and organics. At the same time, uh, the elevated temperatures are allowing for new invasive species and pests to move in, uh, to, particularly to our terrestrial systems uh, and also pathogens. So dramatic changes occurring, um, most of which are not chemical. <clears throat> the US EPA again put together a massive database of over 19,000 data points from across the nation looking at sediment contamination and then trying to relate that to violations of sediment quality criteria or toxicity or impairment. And what was most interesting to me is that if you looked at the rivers um, segment by segment or reach by reach, only 1% of the area of the rivers were actually contaminated. So. 90% of the contamination that we found across the U.S. is really localized to small patchy areas. We tend to focus on the areas we think are bad, and we certainly are finding that's the case, that these are small depositional areas. So that raises the question to ecologists of what's the significance of a patchy area of contamination. We know that organisms, most of them, are very good at avoiding contamination. They sense the presence of many chemicals and they'll move away. So if the contamination is patchy, are they truly being exposed to it or not? So how do we relate that patchiness to ecological impairment? So the, the other patchy issue is more temporal uh, and relates to runoff. So high flow conditions uh, bring in elevated levels of of uh, nutrients, solids, and chemicals. Uh, they also cause resuspension of potentially contaminated sediments, but it's a pulse event. It occurs over a very short period of time, and the concentrations are changing minute by minute. So that is extremely difficult to relate that exposure to an adverse effect. Another issue that folks tend to forget to look at are groundwater upwellings into our streams and rivers. All streams and rivers pretty much have groundwater upwellings. And in urban areas, these can be contaminated, contaminated groundwater moving into the, into the stream and then into the bottom of the stream and out the top. Is this a problem or not? We don't really know because we're not looking at it. Another issue I'll talk about in a few minutes are the periphyton, the photosynthetic communities that live on the surfaces of the sediment and different uh, uh, 
natural surfaces that are there, and what is their role in contaminant exposures? Um, how do the periphyton affect the exposure uh, of organisms that possibly would be eating them? And then lastly, photo-induced toxicity, which is uh, definitely um, occurring. It's, it occurs basically in every urban waterway because it's, it's uh, a result of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, primarily the five ringed ones, uh, such as fluoranthine and anthracene. And when UV light, natural sunlight, hits those compounds, you get oxygen uh, radicals formed, and they're incredibly toxic. So what happens is then every urban waterway has PAHs washing off of the asphalt, off of the streets, from the cars, and when sunlight hits it, it becomes very, very toxic. And here's some data. Uh, you see the high bar uh, is in the shaded exposure. The bar next to it to the right is going to be in the sunlight. Um, over time, and we always find this phototoxicity occurring. Uh, at night, no, there's no sunlight. In the shade, no. Under leaves, uh, in protected habitat, no. When the waters are turbid, no. So this is a pulse event, essentially, that's occurring, but it's occurring frequently. So, if we have all of these dynamic conditions uh, that are changing exposure, sometimes minute by minute, and, and certainly over days uh, and seasons. How do we assess that correctly? How do we go out as ecotoxicologists or environmental chemists and collect data that's going to be useful? Well, the way that we have done it the last 20, 30 years has been doing more and more field exposures or in situ exposures where we cage our organisms and we put them in the field so that they are more likely to see a typical exposure that includes sunlight, changes in water quality, changes in solids, uh, so that we get a more accurate measure. And here are some of the, the ways that we've done that. Sometimes it's just simple streamside uh, mesocosms that pump water in and out and there's sediment in these from the stream and they're seeded with organisms from the stream or we're putting out uh, lots and lots of cages uh, that have sediment in them so that they can be colonized uh, by the local uh, macroinvertebrates uh, or even very very small uh, cages for looking at, at periphyton surfaces that are in the stream <clears throat> Of course, the lab is extremely important uh, to figure out mechanisms and to look at more detail at fewer parameters. So we've done a lot of work in the last few years trying to understand metal bioavailability. So we've used uh, river, basically stream flumes in the lab that are flow through water, and we bring sediments in in lots of small units and then spike them with different uh, metals and follow uh, the partitioning of those metals through time and as it's related to toxicity. And here you can see some data. Uh, this is growth rate of the amphipod hyalella uh, versus concentrations of total copper from 250 up to um, 750 uh, parts per million. And you see that rapidly through time, um, or through concentrations that the, the uh, toxicity changed, um, the growth rate changed through time um, from day seven to day 213. Initially, high levels of toxicity, uh, low growth, but then um, after the sediments equilibrated and the, the metals actually became more highly partitioned, uh, you saw no, basically no effects uh, occurring to growth. And so what we saw here was really dramatic changes in acid volatile sulfides as they oxidized uh, and the, the metal started complexing with iron amorphous or crystalline oxides through time and those became good predictors of toxicity or bioavailability as did poor water concentrations because you're only going to see the free dissolved metal uh, in the poor water. 
Bioturbation is another phenomenon that's going on in most aquatic systems. And, and here you see some nice data from uh, Dr. Aaron Packman at Northwestern University. Uh, and he's looking at oxygen changes. Uh, this is the surface of the sediment. And these uh, peaks of oxygen that go down deep into the sediment or through here are actually from uh, oligochaetes, aquatic earthworms that are burrowing into the sediment. So you see this upper few centimeters of sediment is dramatically changing from a redox perspective, which means the toxicity is dramatically changing through time. We've done uh, a lot of work uh, in, in the last two years uh, looking at some of these redox issues uh, in, com in relation to the drying and the uh, wetting of sediments. Uh, as climate change increases, we're going to have, as, as we talked about, more drought where rivers and lakes are lower, more exposed sediment, and then we'll have extreme events where they quickly flood uh, and those sediments become inundated. One of the sites we looked at was a mining site where they had mined for vanadium. Uh, there's not a lot known about vanadium, so we spent a lot of time doing some basic chemistry. But this was the, uh, one of our tests we're with in the, in the lab, and these were our lab uh, mesocosms. And these little chambers in here are actually covered with mesh uh, and contain uh, daphnia and hyalella. So they're exposed to the sediments and the overlying water. And then we have these rhizon uh, samplers so that we can pull out pore water from the mesocosms through time and also surface water. And this is mimicking uh, the reservoir, which is downstream from the mine. Here you see the mine, and it flows uh, into this reservoir. Uh, and this is the winter time when the, the reservoir is drawn down. And these are exposed sediments. Uh, the, the light uh, colored are all exposed sediments. Then in the springtime, uh, the reservoir fills back up. So these very same sediments are now flooded. So every twice a year, we, we see this fluctuation of, of saturation of the sediments. And these sediments are loaded with multiple metals. So what is happening to those metals through time? Here we see some of the basic chemistry that's occurring um, with, with vanadium, um, where we have uh, plus three, plus four, plus five states. Um, and following the uh, flooding, uh, the oxidized sediments uh, ended up increasing in vanadate in the pore water. And then they reduced and became uh, the non-toxic plus floor state. So uh, these were our two hypotheses. One that was oxidized sediment would actually increase the toxicity. Um, and here's some data to show you just how bad the, the uh, site was. And maybe you can't see it at the, at the back of the room, but I'll walk you through it. These are two points in time, uh, one month versus another month. And this is uh, copper, uh, nickel, and zinc. And the key thing to look at is this line right here. This is the probable effect concentration for toxicity. So that means anything above that level has been uh, predicted to be acutely toxic, very toxic to benthic organisms. So you see we have some of the sites, the stations, that have elevated toxic levels of copper, nickel, and zinc. Um, and that stays the same no matter when you sample it. Just um, uh, here is a, a cartoon that, that shows you uh, s some of the data that we've gotten. And here is the relationship between high level growth, the amphipod, and tissue concentrations of zinc. So we got a really nice correlation of 0.85, uh, showing that as after the zinc got to uh, a, key le uh, a key point, the, it uh, adversely affected the growth. But here we see, show the oxidized sediments that are exposed. Um, that there we have acidification reactions occurring, and then inundation occurs, and we get zinc sulfides formed um, and reduced sediments. And for vanadium, we found 75% was present as plus 3. Uh, only uh, less than 1% was present as at plus 5 state. Uh, some more summary data shows you um, 
the sediment oxidation leading to zinc release. So once these sediments, uh, oxidized sediments, were reflooded, we had uh, high levels of, of poor water zinc occur, uh, which, which correlated with uh, the reduced form of iron plus two, um, and we saw decreased growth occurring uh, in these sediments. So every time these sediments got flooded, some of this zinc would pour into the, would go into the poor water in the overlying water and cause a toxic event. This did not happen with the copper and nickel. It was only the, uh, the zinc that had occurred. So we, we've done, we like to do the lab field comparisons because we get different information from each, which helps uh, figure out the puzzle. So some of our work has been with these mesocosms that I showed you in the lab that were actually placed in coastal wetlands here uh, in the Great Lakes. And we looked at, at a closer at the release of zinc. Uh, and we found that in the field, this only happened at very high concentrations, over 300 parts per million. As compared to the lab, same sediments, different exposure, where it occurred at only 18 parts per million. So there we've got you know, more than a tenfold, a twentyfold difference in how zinc is released into the, uh, the ecosystem, de depending on if it's a lab or the field. So what does this mean? This means that the laboratory, while it's indicating the mechanism is occurring, it's not giving us the correct information about when it occurs. Uh, so probably this is because there's a lot more ligands present uh, there uh, in the natural system than there are in the, uh, the laboratory. We also found this ele elevated zinc led to a decrease in chlorophyll A that was produced by the periphyton. That's important, obviously, because many organisms eat the periphyton. So uh, let's talk about the biofilm a little more. And here I have it in this uh, cartoon. Uh, so we've got free copper in the overlying water, uh, maybe bound to some dissolved organic carbon. Uh, then at the surface sediments, we see uh, copper bound to the iron oxides. And as we get into the anoxic sediments, uh, it's primarily occurring as copper sulfide with some as organic sulfide. So what we know is that as we have toxic metals come in, they can easily displace the iron from the iron sulfide and become bound up with the sulfide. What's happening then in the periphyton? Well, the periphyton, as is, is you may know, is a complex community comprised of heterotrophs and autotrophs. Uh, so bacteria all the way up to uh, you know, ciliates and rotifers with a, a lot of uh, algae, types of algae and diatoms that are there. Uh, so that community is photosynthesizing during the day and potentially changing the redox condition um, of the surface sediments uh, just because it's right in proximity to it. Um, so let's see what happens. Here we have five different uh, field sites that had varying degrees of sunlight uh, hitting them, open canopy. Um, and in this one is, uh, was a closed canopy system. Uh, and you see the changes in uh, net primary productivity. Uh, across here, we have nickel concentrations, a reference, low, medium, high. And you see this community of periphyton responded pretty dramatically to the elevated levels of copper. Uh, that were in the sediment. But then when we get over here uh, to this system uh, and this system, which are more sunlight systems, and they uh, have a different community, we get very different responses. So the primary productivity is lower and not affected by the copper. And when we looked at the communities that lived here, we saw on this end of the spectrum more green algae, shifting over to diatoms, shifting, shifting over to heterotrophs. So the communities change. They're affected to de varying degrees by the, by the nickel. Uh, but they're also all adsorbing nickel, which means that when things eat it, when benthic invertebrates eat them, they still will be exposed to the nickel. So here's some interesting data that was presented many years ago um, by NIMIC uh, with the USGS.
And not a lot of work has been done to follow up on this through the years, but I think it's, uh, it may be ecologically important. And this is showing the relationship between zinc concentrations in overlying water um, versus um, uh, through time uh, being sampled at day and night. So you see the uh, white uh, in this is sunlight, daytime. Uh, the dark represents night, and um, this is pH on this axis. So look at the fairly dramatic change that you see um, between uh, pH, which is the dark triangles. Uh, so we get a diurnal flux just like we do with the dissolved oxygen. And as the pH drops, we see zinc concentrations going up uh, through the night, and then during the day as the pH rises, we get that zinc preci uh, precipitating out and, and moving out of the water column. So we have a diurnal exposure situation with metals occurring, and we don't look at that. We don't know if this is ecologically significant or not. I want to touch on uh, plastics just because it's been in the news so much, um, and I'm sure it has uh, here in, in Brazil. And you've seen a lot of um, basically horrific pictures uh, in the news of the damage that, that plastics can do, uh, particularly the macroplastics, the large pieces that are taken up into organisms. But what's interesting to me is even though we've seen these horrible pictures of the macroplastics, the regulatory emphasis in North America and Europe has been on the microplastics, the very, very small plastics. And here you see a, a distribution um, of different sizes. So these are um, 5 to 27 millimeters, and here we're going all the way down to 0.5 to 0.3 millimeters uh, that, that are collected from waters. So um, a lot in this larger range and, and less in this lower range. But this is, this is the fraction of microplastics that are being regulated. Here's the pictures of the macroplastics, and uh, here we have the fish gut with all of these plastic uh, pieces that came out. Here we have a fish-eating bird, I believe an albatross, that's got uh, loaded with plastics. And obviously this is causing uh, physical uh, blockage and, and damage, sometimes lethality. And even in our small organisms of daphnia, uh, these uh, are fluorescent uh, microplastics uh, you can see are filling up the gut of the organism. So it, it sounds bad, doesn't it? Um, we know that plastics adsorb uh, organic chemicals and, and some metals. Uh, here's some data uh, looking at persistent organic pollutants that were sampled from around the world, uh, looking at microplastics, and you see some uh, relatively high concentrations of of uh, POPs associated with some of these plastics. So um, that makes sense, uh, sounds really bad. But at the end of the day, um, if we're talking about ecological risk, it's all about exposure, isn't it? You can't have risk unless you have exposure. So these concentrations that have been reported in the literature have been from surface trawls, and they've usually been reported as numbers of particles per square kilometer. Well, it turns out if you convert those to uh, a volume measure, that is number per liter, uh, the numbers look much, much different. Uh, the, the concentrations that are being used in the lab to, to look at adverse effects like the daphnia I just showed you on the preceding slide, uh, are, they are using exposure concentrations that are two to 10 orders of magnitude higher than what's found in the environment. The worst concentrations found in the environment were 32 microplastic particles per 1,000 liters. Not one liter, 1,000 liters. That's a cubic meter. And the mean was 1.3, I mean 1.9 per thousand liters below wastewater treatment plants, which are the primary source of these particles. Similar sized algae that live in these environments are thousands to tens of millions per liter, not thousand liters. So that means 
that the difference between microplastic exposure and algal concentrations is seven to 10 orders of magnitude. This makes it impossible for organisms, virtually impossible, for them to eat the microplastic. They are trying to feed on algae, they're looking for algae, and algae's everywhere for them. Uh, the microplastics, the microbeads, are a rare find for them. And we looked at 150 fish guts uh, in, in the Lake Erie, which is our most contaminated lake. And these were fish that are at risk from consumption of microplastics. And we did not find a single microbead. We did find a few fibers, and fibers seem to actually be more common. But even the top concentration of fibers was five, and that occurred in less than 20% of the fish. So I think we have a, a lot of science being done and it's being uh, misinterpreted in the press and by the scientists, uh, indicating there's a problem here uh, when there really is not. So how do we diagnose which, uh, how do we determine which stressors, which chemicals are actually causing the problem? We have to use a strategic weight of evidence approach. Uh, that, that characterizes not only the exposures, but the effects and links those two together. We have to link the dominant exposures with the dominant effects to the key species if we want to determine the status of our ecosystem. We have to compare those findings to a realistic reference condition. That is not a pristine forest for human-dominated watersheds. Uh, an agricultural land or an urban area should not be compared to a pristine condition, which is impossible. It needs to be compared to a condition that is the, the desirable condition that we should find in this, uh, for those two, two watersheds. And that helps us determine if we have adverse levels of different stressors. So at the end of the day, we need to figure out a way to, to, to identify the stressors and to rank them, which ones are the worst. And the most pervasive stressors, as you probably know, are dissolved oxygen and nutrients and degraded habitat. And so many of our human-dominated systems have those three problems existing. Yet, at least here in North America and Europe, we tend to focus on the chemicals that are at those sites rather than those three pervasive stressors. So how do we do this? Um, I think we have to use some of the tools I showed you earlier in situ based approaches that better connect exposure and effects. They have fewer sampling uh, and exposure uncertainties uh, associated with them and artifacts that you get in the laboratory um, where you may be oxidizing a sediment uh, that's been reduced uh, or you're uh, releasing organic, dissolved organic matter, which is going to change the uh, bioavailability. And so use those and passive samplers uh, to help integrate the exposures that organisms see over time and reduce artifacts. Here are some of the simplistic tools we've used that were the in situ cages um, being exposed to uh, surface water here. Uh, underneath, they're being exposed to surface sediments uh, and uh, the interface, and, and these are actually buried in, this, in the sediments. Uh, and organisms are added through these tubes after they equilibrate. So here we have three different exposures, uh, three different pathways that represent different organisms. Um, the Daphnia will be seeing this, uh, the amphipods will be seeing this, and the burrowing organisms will be seeing this exposure. Uh, here's a, a more advanced uh, approach that we use that actually has a, a peristaltic pump in it. Uh, powered by lithium batteries that will go for um, many, many, many days. Uh, we've had them out almost a month. Uh, and they're pumping ambient water through these cages uh, continuously. And so we can have different kinds of organisms in the cages. Uh, here you see these being deployed uh, in the field. Uh, in the deeper waters, we've had to use divers to do this. Uh, here's the unit. And look at the, 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 the cord tubes that go through it.
so that we can get a deep uh, sediment exposures um, and, and partition out different kinds of exposures with this system. Here you see uh, these are polychaetes. This was a, a marine uh, harbor ex uh, study and we put them in uh, this syringe and then that syringe was fitted into the top of, of this and uh, container and once, oh here it is showing you at the top, and once it was deployed in the sediment then uh, we depressed that plunger and released these polychaetes into the chamber so that they could be in contact with the sediments. Uh, here's some various clams that we've used uh, and then of course we put uh, sons into one of the chambers so that we can get continual measures of, of water quality. Here's a, a newer approach that we're using. Um, some of you may be f familiar with the toxicity identification evaluation system, which is a biologically based chemical fractionation system that looks at toxicity. So uh, samples, water, effluent, sediments are, are fractionated um, with different resins and materials to partition out different chemical classes. And then you see which of those fractionations are the most toxic and that helps you identify which chemicals you should be worried about at your site. So this is the the first uh, in situ TIE system uh, that's been developed and here you see uh, uh, the this gets often depressed into the sediment so here we have a resin of different types uh, and a pumping system that pulls either pore water or surface water through the resin into this overlying chamber which has uh, organisms in it and then that water goes into a, a sample bottle uh, that we can collect the water and, and do chemical analysis on later. And this is uh, a system that's been deployed underwater. These are only left out for about 24 hours of continual pumping and exposure, excuse me, and here's some data to show uh, what you can get. So here we had uh, three different resins, uh, ambersorb to pull out the nonpolars, uh, zeolite to, to pull out ammonia, and chelex to pull out the metals. And pore water means there was no resin, it was just glass uh, wool. And look at the difference in toxicity, so this is mean survival, 100% uh, survival here. So this site had high levels of PAHs and uh, PCBs and uh, this was looking at the pour water uh, at the site and we saw that the most toxicity occurred in the pour water where there was no resin but then as we added chelex we got improved survival uh, zeolite even better survival but ambersorb by far gave us the best survival and so it really uh, helped document that it was the nonpolar organics that were causing most of the toxicity at this site, despite the arguments from the industry. And then look at what happened in the lab. We got uh, very high survival uh, in the pore water. So this is uh, another indication that the lab can create artifacts uh, and actually reduce the toxicity that might actually be occurring uh, in the system. Resuspension is a, is a phenomenon that's occurring every day, uh, sometimes hundreds of times uh, in a harbor. Uh, and it, it's, whenever we resuspend sediments, we worry about the contaminants associated with those sediments. Um, and here you see a picture of a, a, a shipping container boat, uh, and the, the props are resuspending massive layer, um, quantities of, of surface sediments as it pulls into the harbor. So here's the phenomenon that occurs and the, these resuspended sediments will then drift off and then end up being redeposited elsewhere. So we looked at this with our um, in situ uh, container system I showed you earlier and we actually put this in the plume of resuspended sediments uh, in a couple of different sites um, in Hawaii uh, that were highly contaminated. The sediments were loaded with nonpolars and metals. And what we ended up seeing is that there was no toxicity. Absolutely no toxicity except for a little effects on a bioluminescence in the lab. But why did we not see toxicity when these toxic sediments were resuspended? The exposure was too short. So again, it's all about the exposure. It was just too short of an exposure.
Pharmaceuticals and personal care products are in the news a lot. Uh, we can find those below any uh, municipal wastewater treatment plant. Uh, and we know that some of these are endocrine disruptors and they can change uh, the sex of organisms that are exposed. So virtually uh, everywhere that we've looked for fish intersex below wastewater treatment plants, we find it. So obviously these are adverse exposures that are occurring. What's really interesting though is that there's no site where we have seen a decrease in the fish population. So even though the fish are showing intersex, it's not apparently impacting the population numbers. Uh, we need more studies uh, of this. Uh, when this was done in a lake where the water was not being renewed uh, by Karen Kidd in the Experimental Lakes of Canada, she showed the whole food web collapsed uh, with realistic exposures of nonophenol. So it is a concern, but uh, maybe not the, to the degree of the concern of, of other things. So we looked at this uh, below several plants, and we had uh, this weight of evidence test design where we collected samples upstream of the wastewater plant and downstream of the plant, and we also sampled the effluents. And we did cage fish exposures. We sampled for all the chemistry and we used the 24-hour TIE exposures, but we also looked at habitat and fish macroinvertebrate surveys. And basically what we found is that these other stressors tend to be dominating the system rather than the pharmaceuticals and personal care products. So it was a way of us ranking the stressors at these sites. So <clears throat> what do you often see at these sites? that makes it really a complex puzzle. Well, whenever we have PAHs and phototoxicity, we've got light and total suspended solid issues that we have to think about. Whenever there's temperature issues, there's usually nutrient issues. And the warmer the water is, uh, the more sunlight there is, the more uh, paraphyton and algal growth we're gonna have, and it's gonna change the food web, uh, particularly if there's more nutrients. We often have altered flow and habitat suitability uh, going together um, with siltation occurring at the same time, which is destroying benthic habitat. And the PAHs, pesticides, and metal pulses are coming through primarily in runoff events. So if we go sample the water at low flow, we're probably not going to find those. So we have to be very careful as we interpret our data based on our sampling design on what the correct interpretations are uh, when we relate that back to um, uh, biotic impairment. So the types of one way to get a strategic design is to kind of have a strategic uh, line of evidence approach. Uh, you can categorize the different assessment methods into site characterization, exposure, or effects measures. And so if I'm doing a site, uh, assessing a site, I want to have some of each of these at my site. So I want to characterize the site primarily with habitat flow, but I also want to uh, characterize the exposures that occur, which I can look at tissue residues, um, subcellular molecular biomarkers, models, and even gradients uh, of contaminants. But then I want to link that to the effect uh, lines of evidence, which would be toxicity measures, uh, measures of uh, benthic or fish community um, indices, and environmental quality criteria. Each of these lines of evidence, these assessment methods, has its strengths and its limitations. There is no perfect method. So here on the left side, I have the strengths of these traditional uh, assessment methods. On the right, I have the limitation. And just as an example, water quality criteria, they're easy to use, widely used. We know they work. Uh, but it's a sig single chemical measure. It does not tell us the causality, what's causing the problem. We're extrapolating from lab data to the field. And so the exposure reality is a big question. So understanding these strengths and weaknesses should help you with the interpretations. Uh, these are non-traditional methods that are not usually done, which should be done. One is looking at habitat, groundwater, surface water flow interactions, 
uh, in situ toxicity and in situ TIEs. Again, those have strengths and limitations. We looked at uh, four sites across the U.S. that had different kinds of contamination, and we compared those to the sediment quality guidelines that exist uh, to see how these different lines of evidence uh, compared uh, to uh, the sediment quality guidelines. And if we averaged all of those uh, findings, um, you see that the closest relationship to the sediment quality criteria was the benthic mean index, which was uh, a combination of different benthic macroinvertebrate indices. So that's reassuring that 70% of the time, the benthic response was, was related to whether or not sediment criteria had been exceeded or not. Less so with le lab sediment toxicity, uh, less so with in situ sediment toxicity, and even less with in situ water toxicity. So what does that tell me? Does that mean that these are incorrect? Of course not. They're giving me different information. The criteria, the guidelines, have their own uncertainty associated with them. And this is the truth. What the benthic invertebrates in the, in the stream are showing us is what's really occurring. That's who we're trying to protect. So this says to me, that 30% of the time, the sediment quality guidelines are incorrect. So if I'm only using a chemical specific criteria, 30% of the time I may be incorrect. This is not good if you're spending millions, and do millions of dollars like uh, we often do cleaning up sites if you get it incorrect. So really using each one of these uh, gives me a different perspective of what's going on at the site. Here's a way uh, first shown by Peter Chapman uh, probably 20 years ago and is when he introduced a sediment quality triad. Uh, this is actually five different lines of evidence uh, simply represented as a plus, there was an effect, or a minus, no effect. And you can see how each of these unique lines of evidence is telling us something different which helps us come up with a conclusion of what's really going on at that site. If I delete any one of those lines of evidence, I'm losing information that helped me figure out the problem at the site. So in summary, just the last few slides, how do we better determine which stressors matter? We're usually sampling, sampling at one point in time at one space, uh, which does not tell, tell us about the pretty dramatic uh, temporal and spatial variation we can have. We must focus on those foundation blocks that I mentioned first. Uh, we most, must get the uh, exposure right and, and also look at uh, high flow events, co-occurring stressors, um, and, and really try to document uh, this exposure that the organisms are seeing. Uh, we, we summarized some of this uh, in a focus article we, we wrote in Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry back in 2012. Uh, so if you want to take a look at that, it'll emphasize this and, and talk about other methods which are useful. Uh, so the final assessment and management con considerations, a little bit of duplication here, but, but look at your foundation blocks, see if those are causing the problem. Control erosion and runoff. If you stop runoff of solids, that means you're also stopping uh, siltation, uh, nutrients that are adsorbed to the solids, and metals and organics absorbed to the solids. So this is a great way to improve your waterway. Field validate your conclusions. Don't just depend on the lab. Um, look at the mixture-related effects. Um, and this, if I jump down to the bottom bullet, uh, may be best done by having narrative criteria rather, rather than single chemical criteria. Uh, let's, let's try to determine if that water has a problem or not first before we figure out um, the stressor. And then nomic or genomic, uh, proteomic, uh, enzymatic biomarkers, which are very popular now, are incredibly sensitive. They're becoming increasingly easy to do. But at the end of the day, we still do not do a good job of relating those to adverse community and population effects. So they are primarily an indication of exposure, 
they are not really telling us now if we have an adverse ecological effects. So here's my opinion, uh, the dominant stressors. I think the dominant stressors are really going to get worse uh, due to extreme weather, and that's going to be the nutrient and sediment and chemical loadings that are going to occur, um, and the amplified foundation block effects of, of changes in flow, temperature, and oxia erosion. Uh, that's what we're going to be focused on. The fines, the small uh, particle sediments, are, are the metals, uh, the pHs and habitat alteration are going to dominate in our urban watersheds. Uh, fines, nutrients, and pesticides will dominate in our agricultural watersheds. Uh, and because human-dominated areas are expanding, uh, the water impacts are going to be expanding. So my, my question was, for my title, which chemicals are an ecological risk in the presence of habitat flow and nutrient stressors? I say none. If we have those foundation blocks as stressors, the chemicals are inconsequential. But when they are not stressors, which ones are the biggest risk? And as I just mentioned, I think it's the PAHs and insecticides in the urban areas and in soft water environments, not hard water carbonate environments, it's going to be the metals, copper, uh, zinc, and nickel. Obrigado. Um, we're going to switch over to a Skype uh, exposure, uh, excuse me, a Skype presentation uh, at this point uh, to allow for some questions.